My name is Stephen, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And this has been an unusual week when we've had three different speakers for all of our gatherings. We had the prophetic word from Saturday with uh, Clark, because he came and shared. And it was an awesome word about pure and the holiness and how God makes us into pure gold. And then we have uh, Dave, who spoke at the 909, and Mr. Technical, Mr. Doctrine Man, Mr. Give me the back. In fact, if you want the background of the scripture, listen to Dave's message, and you'll get all the background of Matthew and the Beatitudes, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's this guy, this Canadian guy. Uh, by the way, welcome if you're joining us online. We're so glad you're here. And a special shout out to my family in Canada, eh? Don't be a hoser, okay? Um, it's good to be here this morning to share with you. So we have been sharing in the last several weeks about the upside down kingdom of God. You see, we have a way of working in the natural, but when we submit ourselves to what the Lord wants, it's an upside down understanding. It's not exactly what you think because my way is not his way, right? And we think that my way is the right way, but actually it's not. We need to submit ourselves and let him direct our lives. And so here's now, I'm a belt and suspenders kind of guy, so I have my paper in case my, my uh, technology doesn't work for me. Hallelujah. I might be the old guy on staff, but I'm learning, bless God. <laughs> so here's the upside down kingdom. Do you want to live? Yeah. Oh, I want to live. Then you got to die. There's a book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And the book is called Cost of Discipleship. It says, Jesus bids a man to come and die. So if you want to live, you have to die. So before you have a tree, before you have a, a harvest, you've got to take the seed, put it into the ground. The ground has to die. And then there has to be a season of rain and sun and storm. And all of a sudden, you see growth. There's just something about that in our Christian life. You see, we don't understand that, but that is the process that God wants to take us through to live to die. Do um, you want to be the greatest? Yes, I want to be the greatest. Then pick up a towel and serve. <laughs> things like the suffering servant, the foolish things of the world confound the wise. God's power is perfected in weakness. It's all upside down. To get back at your enemy, <laughs> You love them. Really? I, I read this week about an airplane illustration. Now, I'm not a pilot. I don't like flying. I prefer not to. I only do it when I have to because it's expedient. There's just something about being strapped in a metal tube and, and you can't do nothing about it. But I heard this, that something takes place in an airplane when you are ascending. There was a movie back in the 40s and the 50s. Um, it was called uh, Breaking the Sound Barrier. And they discovered that a plane can only go to a maximum speed of 735 miles an hour. And after that, it disintegrates, it blows apart. And we just couldn't break the sound barrier. But then we discovered, or they discovered, from my understanding, is that if you do something different with the controls at 735 miles an hour, the plane will excel. It will go beyond that. It will break the sound barrier. Instead of push, pushing the lever forward, you bring the lever back or whatever it is. So instead of doing what you would normally do to bring the nose up, you go backwards and the nose goes up instead of going down. And we can't figure it out. But there's something about what God wants to do in our lives. When we submit to his process, when we submit to what he wants to do, that he does the unthinkable in transformation so that we can excel and be the man and the woman of God that he wants us to be. It's upside down controls. It's an upside down kingdom. I want you to know it's the good news. It's not good advice. There's a difference. So, See, the controls that we think how the controls work is I need success, I need wealth, and I need greed. The success that Jesus offers in our life comes through being humble, walking in humility, the poor, the mourners, the peacekeepers. It's not wonderful. That's how God, that's how the kingdom works. It's upside down. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, you can click it, click it in your Bibles, or you can turn in your pages to your Bibles, Matthew chapter 5, and this is a little bit of a paraphrase, and it says this, blessed are those whose cravings for the things of God are just as intense 
as the craving for food and water. Blessed are those who are yearning to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who are hungry to live righteously in his presence, for they will be filled. Now, what creates hunger and thirst for you? Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm watching a movie and I get a great big bowl of popcorn and it's got butter and it's got salt on it and I start chowing down, guess what I get? Thirsty. Isn't it interesting how that salt makes people thirsty? Isn't it interesting as believers how we are the salt of the earth and we make people thirsty for the things of God? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Okay. If you ever walk into Texas Roadhouse and you get one whiff of those buns, those rolls, oh, come on, baby. Give me some of those rolls and slap some butter on it because I am hungry. If my wife has been working on a pot roast all day and it's been in the slow cooker, you know what I mean, and the potatoes and the carrots, and, and you walk into the house, dude, I am ready. Let's eat, get some ketchup out of the fridge and let's go. You see, our stomachs are conditioned to be filled at certain times of the day. Maybe you didn't catch that over here. Maybe you'll catch it. At certain times of the day, our stomachs are conditioned to be filled. Most of us have never experienced life-threatening hunger or thirst. We really haven't. We don't know what that is. Uh, When we say things like, oh, I'm so hungry, it means we miss lunch. (laughs) The Greek word for hunger is this, a passionate longing for something that we cannot live without. Dr. John MacArthur, who's a a pastor, a theologian, he's not as in the same uh, circles as us, but he has some very profound things. He says this, Both hunger and thirst are intense desires. This was a much more powerful concept in the day of Jesus. And so when we say I'm starving, it's completely different to the times of Jesus when people said they were starving. They were literally starving for their life. The word hunger is to famish. The word thirst is to be parched. And the double meaning is to crave intensely. So here's what Jesus says to us. If we want to come to that place of hungering and thirsting for him, he says, abide with me. Hang out with me and you'll get a hunger and you'll get a thirst for me, for righteousness. Stay in the game. Stay in the game. Don't you just don't like it when you're watching a football game? By the way, my Denver Broncos have done some stuff. (laughs) Bring it downtown. Come on. Come on, Don, this year. Look out. Can you say these? Super Bowl. Super Bowl. (laughs) But you see somebody on the sidelines, and they're not paying attention. And it's like, stay in the game. And as believers, don't get so comfortable with your popcorn that you don't stay in the game. So, oh, but pastor, I just don't have time to be hungry for the word of God because I'm just so busy. Well, build a freaking bridge and get over it. You know why you don't have time? Because you don't make time. I don't know about you, but I make time for things that are important in my life. It's just not a priority to you. And so maybe it's time for us. Remember these old GPS things we used to have in our car? Uh, We don't have them anymore because now we have them on our phones. And and you would go off course and and it would all of a sudden, recalculate, recalculate, recalculate. Maybe we need to recalculate what's important to us. Can I, I don't mean to step on toes, but 60 minutes a week is not going to cut the mustard for you guys. 
If this is all you get, then honey, you are starving during the week because you're not getting what you need. Jeremiah chapter 15. Oh, listen to this. It says, your words were found and I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. When I heard your word, my heart rejoiced. It was the rejoicing and the joy to me. Another version says, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. Wow. I mean, that is very visual to me. When you devour something, you just clean it up. They are my joy and my delight. One of the signs that helps me when something is wrong is to lose my appetite. It helps me understand that something's wrong. For example, when Susan makes spaghetti and meatballs. Oh, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Now, this ain't no ragu or pragu or whatever it is from the shelf. <laughs> Honey, this is special ingredients all mixed together from my grandma to my mom and now to us. And when she tells me in the morning, oh, we're having spaghetti tonight. All day, that's all I'm thinking about all day. When I get home, I'm having spaghetti and meatballs. I am so looking forward to it. Bring it on. So when I walk in the door and I turn my nose up at spaghetti and meatballs, then you know that something is wrong. And that actually happened during my cancer recovery where she asked me, what do you want? Because I wouldn't eat anything. What do you want? I want spaghetti. And I came home. It's like, nope, you're going to make me barf. If I even touch that spaghetti, something is going on in here that's wrong. It's not right. What's wrong? Another thing is uh, my favorite restaurant in the whole wide world is in Canada. Go to the next slide. It's the Swiss Chalet. Oh, baby. It's actually one of the places where it all began. I got my appetite back after cancer. And I order the same thing every time I go. Even though they have tons of stuff on the menu, I order one thing. Next slide. Quarter chicken white, barbecue, quarter chicken white, uh, rotisserie chicken with fries, double, well, that's actually triple sauce there. And then there is a Canadian iced tea and there's a roll. And, oh, baby, it's so good. It is, now, if I walk into a restaurant and that's sitting at my plate and I don't eat it, something is wrong. And everybody that knows me, because I'm like almost part owner in that restaurant, <laughs> something is really, in fact, I'm going to be in Canada in just a few weeks going up to see my mom. That's one of the first places we're going. Got it? <laughs> okay, now catch this. If you don't catch anything else, catch this. This is going to hurt. When you lose hunger and thirst for the things of God, something is wrong. When you no longer have hunger and thirst for the things of God, then something is wrong inside of you. When you lose a craving for fellowship with people, something is wrong. When you isolate yourself, when you become an island, when you say, I don't need anybody else, something is wrong. When you lose your desire to serve the Lord, Oh, bro, you, you crossed the line. You don't be, you don't be talking. You, you in my face now. You just get away. I'm promising you, when you lose the desire to serve the Lord, something is wrong. Well, you see, I served the church once. Bless God. The church hurt me. Oh. <laughs> Truly, hey. I could ask who's been hurt in this auditorium, and we could all say, we've all been hurt. It's just part of life. And what was a reason becomes an excuse. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, there was a reason I got hurt. Maybe I said something stupid. They said something stupid. We did something wrong. Okay, I get it. But aren't we believers? Don't we forgive and move on? And when that reason turns into an excuse, then that's a problem. So here's a way to get that hunger and thirst for God back. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. 
Uh, turn in your Bibles there. I'm going to take a quick little swig here. This is awesome. But seek first. Say that word with me, first. First. Say it again. Okay, but seek first. Now, when I think of that word first, here's some things that go through my mind. The most important. Priority. The highest. Number one. Showtime. When the rubber meets the road. The main thing. Make the main thing the main thing. Don't forget to make the main thing the main thing. Get going. That's what I think of when I think of the word first. It goes on to say, but seek first the kingdom. Say the word kingdom. Kingdom. Let's say it again. Kingdom. Kingdom. Now, when I think of the word kingdom, I think of a domain in which something is dominant. I think of dying to my kingdom because it says in the scripture, there is a way that seems right unto man. There is a kingdom that seems right unto man. But then it goes on to say, but the end thereof is death. So we understand that my way is not his way. And so we're, we're submitting to his kingdom. So it goes on to say, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now say that with me, righteousness. Righteousness. Now righteousness. It's more than doing the right thing. It's having a right relationship. Uh, The problem with just doing the right thing is it becomes very performance-based. And we can become performance-based in our Christianity. We we really can. Uh, Performance-driven. Happiness is based upon achievement. When we're good, we have approval. When we're bad, we have disapproval. With that kind of an understanding, God's going to end up being distant to us. Uh, God is going to be estranged to us because we're either good or bad. We're either in or out. And then we're going to live our life in fear. And we're going to fear God. And a lot of people fear God because, because they don't have that understanding of the relationship with him. When we walk and hunger and thirst for his righteousness in our lives, listen to this, distance is replaced with intimacy. There's something about when we're in worship together and you're just intimate together and God is speaking to you. It's like that is what happens in relationship in righteousness with Christ in us, the hope of glory. Engagement or estrangement is exchanged for love. We have love. I've heard people say, I just love the family. This is so much like a family. That's because we are. Hey, And Leslie, I know you're at home watching. You couldn't be here. But thank God they helped you through that operation. And you're recovering in Jesus' name. And we love you because we're family. Hallelujah. Fear is obliterated and we have trust. And there's something about trust. So the last thing, it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Say things. Things. things (laughs) things <laughs> mm-hmm. things now what are things well part of the things is my spouse part of the things is my job my vocation part of the things is my house part of the things is the car that i drive it's the boat that i use oh can you hardly wait i can hardly wait till we can get on the lake get on that beach get to get our little kayaks out of storage and just come on baby it's good. those are all things now I've taught this for a long time with uh, teenagers and young adults. They're so concerned about their calendar. Who am I going to marry? What am I going to do? Where am I going to go to school? How much money am I going to make? You know, what's my job going to be? And my counsel to them is this. Don't be so, so concerned about your calendar. Be more concerned about your character. Because if you work on your character, God will take care of your calendar. So don't be going after Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright or all those kinds of things. Seek Jesus. Go after Jesus, and he'll take care of all the calendar stuff in your life. So here's the problem. So there's a divine order to this. The divine order is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. But here's what we do. We take the things 
and put them at the beginning. If I seek all these things, and then I'll seek you, and then I'll do the right thing to sing, and then, no, you see, that's where you get messed up, folks. You got to get it in the divine order. Seek first the kingdom of God, and then his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. And then he says this promise to us. If you hunger and thirst for his righteousness, you will be filled. It means you'll be satisfied. It means you'll be spiritually prosperous. It means that you'll have favor with God. Another word for filled is stuffed. You ever been stuffed? Go to a buffet, a buffet, and you just chow down, man. I mean, they got it all. And you just, oh, I am so stuffed. I can't eat another bite. To be so satisfied with the presence of Jesus in your life that you can't eat another bite. It's not something we do. It's something that God does because it's upside down. And the byproduct of hungry and thirsting is that we will be complete, we'll be satisfied, we'll be content, we'll be stuffed. And then there's the pure in heart, chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Two young adults were involved in a fender bender in a parking lot of a, a, near a grocery store. And they just got exploded at each other. They were yelling, it's your fault. Oh, why did you do that? Can't you see? Are you blind? I mean, just, they went off on each other. After about 10 minutes, cooler heads prevailed, and they called the police. And so they're both standing there while waiting for the police, and they start talking. And they realize that they got a lot of things in common together. Wow, oh, that's that, that's interesting. They, um, and there was a little bit of chemistry between the two of them. It's like, oh, really? Oh, I can't believe that. And the woman says, you know, maybe it's God's will that we had this accident <laughs> and that we had this opportunity to meet each other. And he wow. goes, well, yeah, I think that is true. You know, and then she said, you know, it's kind of silly that we would be standing out here and like, why don't we get in my car where it's warm and we'll just wait for the police. And he thought, well, I'm, I'm up for that. Let's go for that. They get inside the car and they're talking in the car. And then she says, you know, I just went shopping and I got some wine and uh, I have some paper cups and, and maybe, we should, maybe we should have a toast to our, our chance friendship and getting together. He thought, well, I think that's a great idea. So she gets the wine out and pours it in both cups and, and they said, let's toast to each other. And they toast it and he takes, and he noticed that she didn't drink. And he looked at her and he said, uh, aren't you going to toast with me? And she goes, well, you know, I think I'm going to wait till the police come. Motives. Motives. The Bible teaches it isn't enough to just do the right thing. It's doing the right thing with the right motives. God doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the heart. What are your motives for being here today? Are you pursuing? Are you hungering and thirsting for his righteousness? Or are you here out of obligation? Are you here, well, it's just the thing that I do on Sundays. I come to church and, well, you see, I've been doing it since I was a little kid, so I just am conditioned to come. Or are you hungering and thirsting for his righteousness in your life? You know, it doesn't really matter how long you've been on the way or in the way. Jesus still has something to teach us for us to learn. I was thinking about it the other day. I graduated from Bible college in 1978. Some of y'all weren't even born then. And I remember, gradu I thought I had the world by the tail. Bless God, I'm going to save everybody I talk to. I know everything there is about the Bible that I need. And you know what I found out? I really don't. And here we are 43 years later, and I still know because I'm still growing because we're still learners, because we're still willing to be taught the word of God and learn more things. If you praise God on the weekend with your lips 
and your heart through the week is not connected to him at all, then you're not hungry and thirsting after righteousness. You might be filling a spot in a chair this morning, but you are not really pursuing that. If God doesn't have your heart, he doesn't have you. He has to have your heart. Pure in heart, the definition is, the, word, the Greek word is karthos, which means clean without defect or blemish. In the day of Jesus, purity was a big deal. There was a lot of ceremonial things that they would do to be pure because that was really important. There was a lot of ritual obedience, obeying a set of regulations, the things that they had to do. For example, when they would come to eat, they would have to wash their hands and and they would have to go through a certain ritual of washing their hands and they would have to hands up like this and then they would have to go like this and then they'd have to go like this and then they'd have to point their hands down and if they didn't follow all those things exactly, they were not clean and it was really important to be clean. Hundreds of Jewish regulations that they had to follow to be pure. To be pure was really an external thing, observing outward ceremonies. And then Jesus blew the doors off it with three words. He said, you have to be pure in heart. Say it again, pure in heart. (laughs) To be single-minded, to be undivided, Unmixed motives. Proverbs chapter 16 says, People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. For example, you can do some things that look right on the outside, but if you don't have the right motive, it's wrong. Gavin? Bless God. Here's my tithe. Woo! See, I'm putting this tithe in the bucket. Yes, I'm a wealthy man. Bless God. God's been good to me. I just want to be faithful with my tithe. Hallelujah. There it goes. First of all, if you have to fight to give your tithe, uh, there's something wrong. And you put your tithe in the bucket. Or y'all like some do it online, all that kind of stuff. My, my kids are teaching us this new program on uh, the computer. It's called Truebill. And it's teaching you how to do your finances in a different way because I'm kind of archaic. And uh, they said, Dad, you got to do this, man. And so I get it. Some people like to give their tithes online. That's okay. You do it. I still believe in the Old Testament that says, bring, bring your tithe. Hallelujah. Enough said. But you know what? I don't care how much money you put in the bucket. If your motive is wrong, ding, ding, ding. How about when we pray? Oh, Father, I beseech thee. Almighty God. Hallelujah. I pray, oh God, that you would move in our midst. I am your humble servant. Wow. I think it says something about going and praying in your closet. (laughs) How about the scripture when it says, when you fast, don't disfigure your face. What are you doing? I'm fasting. (laughs) That doesn't give any glory to God. What's your motive for what you're doing it? Are you hungering and thirsting? After his righteousness, or is your motive mixed? The scripture says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Anybody can look spiritual. Anybody can look holy. Anybody can look like a Christian on the outside. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Sometimes we look great, but then you know what? Our behavior nullifies our statement of faith. This right here is pure. 100% orange juice. 
I looked at it. I, mean, I, want, I don't want no concentrate. I don't want no, I, don't, I want 100% orange juice. Now, I'm going to admit, and honey, I'm admitting this to you. Well, you know this already. I have an addiction. 100% orange juice. She says, I go through it like water. Okay, that's okay. So, which one says pure? So, I'm going to put it in this glass right here. Mmm. Now, here's another glass. And I'm going to put just a little bit of orange juice in it. But you see, there's something else that, well, I really feel that I should add, and it's called progressive Christianity, that I need to add to my orange juice. Now, I, Craig, I didn't even know there was a progressive Christianity movement until you preached about it several months ago. It's for real. Do you know what it does? Well, and then there's this thing. It's called Current culture. Well, I have to be relevant to the culture. So I've got to change some of the pureness of the word of God. You know, I've got to make it relatable to people. So I just have to change a little bit. And I add a little bit. Well, then there's this my way. Because I know. Uh, there's my truth and there's your truth. You know, don't get me going on that, honey, because we could have a whole conversation about that. There is the truth, the way, the life, not my truth, my way. No, no, no. But would you do that? Oh, well, it's got to be add my way. Now, here's the deal, Vern. These kind of look the same. But one of them is denying the power thereof. I can drink this. so good. And I can drink this. Something's not right. Don't get sucked in and dilute. Or dilute? Is that the right word? Okay. I thought that was just a Canadian word. The word of God. Don't have mixed motives. Don't have mixed understandings, but really be pure. And take in the pure of the gospel. Don't change the word of God to fit what the world is doing. Have the world fit what the word of God does. That's what we need to do. I don't want to disappoint you, but I'm going to sing a song. It's an old one by Jack Hayford in the 1970s. I would sing this song over and over and over again in my car, walking down the road. Last night, I got, woke up at 1 o'clock in the morning humming this song. And by the way, Dave, my wife and I have the same problem in bed. Um, well, you weren't here for Dave's sermon. <laughs> now you all going to go listen to Dave's message. When I get into bed... We need some understanding. <laughs> um, sometimes, <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> this is not the most embarrassing. That's for another time. But sometimes Susan is in bed before I get there, and I get into bed, and my hands and my feet are really cold, and I just like to snuggle. And I will just put, try to put my arms around her. Get off of me. You're freezing. I said, I'm not freezing. I'm just fine. No, get away. Because she's all snugly warm, and I'm bringing something else into the, into the atmosphere. You know what I mean? Why did I even say that? I don't know. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. <laughs> Seriously. I'm an old soul, and there's songs that just really, sometimes really grab me, and this is one of them. May I stand, O oh Lord, in this holy place. 
May I worship you and behold thy face. May I be transformed by thy word and thy spirit and behold the day of thy power. May I stand, O Lord, in this holy place. May I worship you and behold thy face. May I be transformed by thy word and thy spirit and behold the day of thy power. I will stand, O Lord, in this holy place. I will worship you and behold thy face. I will be transformed by thy word and thy spirit and behold the day of thy power. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Isn't there just something about the sweetness of God's presence? When we just come together with our alabaster box and we just pour it out before him and all the cares of the world and all the things that really seem to matter to us, he can kind of come along and rearrange them. And he can say, seek me first. Seek my kingdom first and my righteousness and all the other stuff will play out. I'll take care of all the other stuff if you'll seek me first. Purity isn't only the absence of corruption in your life, but it's the fullness of the presence of God in your life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it looks the same. It looks the same. But there's something different about this one because there's the fullness of the oranges in here. And there's something about the fullness of God's presence that's in this glass. Don't get mixed up with the things and the dilution of the world. A pure in heart, to the pure in heart, maintain their purity by making a point to visit with God on a regular basis to worship together. You know, in the old days, we used to come to Sunday morning church and Sunday night church. And Sunday school. Just saying. Personal prayer. You say, well, I don't know how to pray. Well, okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock from 7 to 8, we have a prayer time right here. Wednesday afternoon from 12 to 1, we have a prayer time right here. Thursday morning from 7 to 8, we have a prayer time right here. You want to learn how to pray? Come and join us for an hour of prayer. Bible study. Join a small group. How are you going to get free? Get into a small group. That's one of our things. Get free. Fellowship with other believers. And it goes on to say, if we do all those things, we will see 